Okay, so let me introduce uh, Christina, and uh, she is uh, the second, uh, so she, she did the second event uh, of our history of consciousness uh, speaker series. And uh, we will have other two events. You can see the flyer on, on the door, and you are very welcome to join all the events of our speaker series. Uh, so let me see a couple, say a couple of things about uh, Christina. Uh, is an uh, associate professor of uh, American Studies and Human Rights uh, at the Trinity College. She's also the editor of uh, the important book, Policing the Planet, Why the Policing Crisis Led to Black Lives Matter. And the book was published by Perso in 2016. Uh, recently, she published uh, Arise. This is the book. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> Global Radicalism, Radicalism in the Era of the Mexican Revolution, University of California Press, 2022. And I just uh, learned that the book is going to be translated, or maybe is already translated into Spanish, and uh, it will be published in Mexico for uh, La Cigara Press. Last but not least, she's also the co-director of the Trinity Social Justice Initiative. Uh, please join me in welcoming the speaker and you have a thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Max. Thank you to, so I'm going to have to do this hybrid where I'm looking at everybody simultaneously in multiple temporalities. All right. Uh, well, thank you, Max. Thank you, History of Consciousness. Thank you, History. Thank you, all you wonderful people, whoever you are behind the mask. And thank you for everybody who's zooming in. Um, I have huge thanks to Sadie Lynn, who made some magic happen today. Thank you very much. And also thanks to Ruby, who participated in that magic. So I'm very excited to be here speaking with you all about my new book, Arise Global Radicalism in the Era of the Mexican Revolution, and to think a little bit specifically about the challenge of making internationalism today. I don't think I need to tell anybody in this room or anybody zooming in about how essential the challenge of uh, creating, collectively creating internationalism is today. Internationalism, as I understand it, recognizes how people have been unevenly waylaid by the development of capitalism across space and how people have developed forms of revolutionary solidarity in spite of social and spatial divisions, including national borders. Uh, I think internationalism has historically reflected distinct spatial imaginaries of the world system, and accordingly, its interpretations have been varied. I've written a new book that tries to make sense of the histories and struggles of how people have made internationalism. And to frame our discussion today, I'll be presenting uh, from one of the chapters, just so that we all have a sense of what this book is about. In the history, of, uh, in the tradition of social history, every chapter of the book is named after um, process, how to make love, how to make a flag, how to make a map. Uh, how to make a living, how to make history. And for today, I'll be presenting from the introduction, which is called How to Make a Rope. So everybody ready? Everybody comfortable? Everybody hydrated? All right. Too bad if not. It's too late. Here we go. So how to make a rope. The ideal rope explained the Upson Walton Company in their 1902 booklet achieves attention so perfect that if a heavy weight were attached to one end, pulling the rope to its full length, quote, the weight would not turn. For such a weight, an industrialist of the period might envision loads of grain, barrels of oil, or freights of precious minerals. For a rancher, bales of wool or bundles of leather might stretch the imaginary cables. The shipper might picture a uh, cargo drawn high above the ocean, then lowered gently without rotation onto the docks below. Ropes, of course, were commonly enlisted into more nefarious service. Coiled, tangled, or laid flat, each length was potent with malice, 13 simple twists away from becoming a noose. 
In the Jim Crow era of vigilante violence and sexual warfare, ropes could fasten commodities as easily as they might bind arms, break necks, or strain against the turning weight of a human body. Neither the mining owner, the shipping magnate, nor the commercial rancher would expect to see such grisly functions portrayed in their trade brochures, and nor would they need to. As the history of the 19th century had already proven, the means of securing capital were often indistinguishable from the mechanisms of organizing racist terror. In November 1871, the Chicago Tribune published an eyewitness account of such terror. Three Black men, Squire Taylor, who was 45, George Johnson, who was 39, and Charles Davis, who was 68 years old, were kidnapped from a county jail by the Ku Klux Klan and lynched in Charleston, Indiana. Aware that an impending mob was coming that night, the reporter had arranged to sleep in the sheriff's office, ensuring that he was, quote, awake at the contemplated, at the hour of the contemplated violence. When the Klan did arrive, the sheriff at first refused to unlock the cell doors. The mob proceeded to bludgeon the jail bars with axes, sledgehammers, and chisels, quote, white heat sparks following every blow. The reporter observed how the Klansmen's eyes seemed to glow through their masks like those of famished wolves. For nearly four hours, Taylor Johnson and Davis were trapped, watching in silence as the locks before them were battered, their executioners pounding and panting without restraint. Around two in the morning, the sheriff decided to put an end to the jail's structural damage. He retrieved the keys from their hiding place in the back of the building knotted on a piece of string and anchored to a window bar, the keys swung between the jail's outer walls and the bleak expanse of night. The Tribune's article was entitled Mask and Manila. The mask, of course, referred to the Klan's muslin hoods, while Manila referenced the, quote, brand new whitish ropes used to hang them in. Each rope, it noted, had been prepared in advance with the news, quote, showing that someone was at work who understood his business. Manila, a fiber that Filipinos called abaca, was a derivative of the plantain plant. The fibrous bark was ideal for rope, making it one of the most valuable indigenous products of the archipelago, according to mid-19th century trade guides. Royal Spanish galleons sailing between colonial port cities in the Philippines and Mexico had used Manila rope for their rigging. Found to be sturdier, less likely to mold, or to be eaten by insects, Manila imports to the United States grew precipitously after 1850, soon replacing other imported fibers like Indian jute and Russian hemp. When the abolitionist John Brown was captured in 1859, trying to spark an armed insurrection of enslaved people in Harper's Ferry, Virginia, southern states actually competed to deliver the rope to hang him. Kentucky's hemp rope ultimately beat out South Carolina's rope of cotton. Manila soon surpassed all these domestically grown fibers. By the turn of the century, Manila was the most popular rope making fiber in the United States, and as headlines suggested, it was nearly synonymous with rope itself. The 1902 booklet observed that a surplus of Manila fiber was, quote, brought into our lap following the 1898 Spanish American War and Philippine American War of 1899 to 1902. With those wars, the United States seized imperial control over the Philippines, obtaining a near monopoly over the country's exports, two thirds of which consisted of Manila. Though demand for rope making fiber soared, especially after it was deemed strategic war material during World War I, the sustainability of the abaca uh, supply was soon cast into doubt. Quote, the user of Manila hemp, reasoned the Waterbury Company in its 1920 catalog, is dependent entirely upon our foreign possessions in the East. This fraught dependence meant that, quote, the procuring of hemp for rope making is attended with some difficulty. Indeed, U.S. reliance on Manila was imperiled as Filipino workers and rebels fiercely resisted U.S. imperial policies, just as they had overthrown Spanish colonial rule from which U.S. governing practices were adapted. Catalogs of U.S. cordage companies in the early 20th century attest to this industrial and geopolitical crisis. They agree that no solution could be found in a domestic market. Rather, for a profitable, plentiful, and stable supply of rope making fiber, U.S. industrialists had only to look south of their border. While Manila imports declined, U.S. imports of Mexico's rope making fibers, Hennequin and Sisal, exploded primarily used as agricultural twine to bind bushels of grain and bales of hay. 
Hennequin and sisal were easily joined with other fibers to make ropes of varying widths and strengths. Derived from the spiny agave cactus, the fibers, both of which were often called hennequin, grew plentifully in the southernmost Mexican state of Yucatan, a product of its hot, dry climate, its flat landscape, and the unrelenting input of its indigenous labor force. Beginning in the 1870s, it, landless Maya Indians had been conscripted to work on Hennequin plantations or haciendas after their commonly held land were expropriated by the state under the regime of President Porfirio Diaz. Consigned to debt peonage, the Maya had little choice but accept labor contracts that could be sold or traded among local Yucatecan Hennequin capitalists or Hennequineros, though rarely ever paid off. Locked into debt, Hennequin workers faced brutal conditions, long hours, and regular lashings with Hennequin whips. Hennequineros justified the beatings with the adage, los indios no oyen sino por las nalgas, the Indians only hear with their asses. In addition to exhaustion, injury, and disease, many Maya also succumbed to epidemics of suicide. In 1909, British travel writers insisted that the Hennequin labor regime had cracked the indigenous workforce on a, quote, wheel of tyranny so brutal, the heart of them is dead. As demand for Hennequin fiber boomed, Hennequineros conspired with federal Mexican officials to capture workers from around the country. In a coordinated plan called El Enganche, or The Hook, Thousands of war deserters, prisoners, vagrants, and political dissidents, which included Huastec Indians from Veracruz and Yaqui Indians from the northern border, were ensnared. Hunted by the Mexican government, as well as by U.S. officials, rebellious Yaquis were sent to the Yucatan haciendas in chains, declared by Porfirio Diaz to be, quote, obstinate enemies of civilization. Two-thirds of the Yaquis subsequently died. Barbarous labor conditions meant shortened lives for the workers and high turnover rates for Hennequineros. Between 1878 and 1910, labor recruiters added an additional 10,000 contract workers from Cuba, Italy, Spain, the Canary Islands, China, Japan, and Java, including nearly 3,000 from Korea. Enclosed by barbed wire, disciplined by overseers, and dependent on tiendas de raya or company stores, which often had uh, jail cells attached to them, Hennequin plantations were effectively transformed into a vast federal prison for indentured segments of the global working class and so-called Indios Badros, or hostile Indians. Through debt and corporal punishment, Hennequin workers were forced to accept hunger, unsanitary conditions, and insufficient medical care for their children. Records also reveal that women were routinely coerced into relationships with Hennequineros ensuring that the threat of rape or compulsory sexual arrangements menaced every hacienda. Out of these brutal regimes, a motley international force of the criminalized, the violated, and the expropriated produced the raw material of 20th century rope. No other company benefited from Yucatec and Hennequin more than the Chicago-based McCormick Harvesting Machine Company, McCormick sold agricultural machines that harvested grain and bound it into sheets using Hennequin binder twine. These reaper binder machines scaled up commercial production, enabling agribusiness in the Midwest United States to explode. Such explosions, of course, occurred alongside an intensified expropriation of indigenous land. Laws like the 1887 Dawes Act privatized millions of acres of communally held tribal land in the region, enabling their settlement and agglomeration for capitalist agriculture. Through new reaper binder technology and ongoing settler colonial violence, native territories in the Midwest were further transmogrified into the nation's so-called breadbasket. With J.P. Morgan's financial backing, McCormick absorbed several of its major competitors, becoming International Harvester, or IH, in 1902. IH investors learned that a blend of Philippine abaca and Mexican hennequin made ideal binder twine for Midwest grain and quickly invested in the Yucatan. By 1910, IH owned 99.8% of the entire Yucatecan fiber trade. In Chicago, as in the Yucatan, millionaires pressed wealth from the tangles of international misery. Aware of the growing concerns over the Yucatan's labor conditions, IH officials addressed this in the 1910 issue of their company magazine, writing, quote, there is nothing, there is nothing in the nature of slavery in the Yucatan, 
Every man is free and receives his pay as regularly as the workman in American factories. The statement was unwittingly ironic, given that workers had famously protested labor conditions against McCormick Chicago factories where the reaper binder machinery was made. Demanding an eight-hour day with no cut in pay, McCormick's iron molders had joined thousands of Chicago workers and tens of thousands nationally in a general strike on May 1st, 1886, organized by the Industrial Union, the Knights of Labor. On May 3rd, two striking McCormick workers were killed by the police. The next day, demonstrators poured into Chicago's Haymarket Square in protest. A bomb went off during the rally and police responded by firing into the crowd. And when the dust settled, several men were dead and over a hundred were injured. Eight high profile labor activists were arrested and charged with conspiracy to murder. All eight were convicted in a show trial designed to intimidate organized labor. Four of the Haymarket organizers, August Spies, Albert Parsons, Adolf Fisher, and George Engel were executed in a gruesome public hanging. Before he was hung, Spies shouted from the platform, quote, the time will come when our silence will be more powerful than the voices you strangle today. If the Knights of Labor had organized under the slogan, an injury to one is the concern of all, Haymarket demonstrated the maxim's global resonance. Around the world, the 1st of May became known as International Workers' Day or May Day. In 1913, the Yucatan-based Casa del Obrero Mundial organized Mexico's first major uh, May Day demonstration, which was complete with a Haymarket commemoration. Later, Mexican legislation declared the day a, quote, cause of pride, not only for the proletariat of the United States, but for the whole world. Writing from Mexico City in 1921, veteran labor organizer Mary Mother Jones bore witness to this solidarity. Jones was shocked to see Mexican workers enter the hall carrying the Mexican flag alongside a banner dedicated to the Chicago martyrs. The honor said Jones was, quote, the most remarkable demonstration I had witnessed in all my years of industrial conflict. To this day, May Day in Mexico is celebrated as the Day of the Martyrs of Chicago. From their brutal harvest in the Yucatan to the hanging of the Haymarket organizers and back, ropes interlinked circuits of capital and empire, as well as the swell of international resistance rising against them. Ropes in the tumultuous first decades of the 20th century were often curious composites of coexisting global regimes of accumulation. Manila from US imperial control over the Philippines, cotton or domestically produced hemp from brutal Jim Crow sharecropping regimes, and henequen produced through the violent exploitation of expropriated indigenous peasants and an indebted dispossessed global proletariat. A further understanding of the financing, the property regimes, the policing, the relations of social reproduction, along with the transport, storage, processing, distribution, consumption, and destruction of this raw material would reveal a vast interlocking universe of exploitation, expropriation, and oppression. Ropes, the ligatures of the global economy, materialize the processes by which the lives of people across disparate spaces are densely interwoven. A social history of ropes demonstrates that when capitalism links spaces, it also links the fate of people compelled into its regimes of accumulation. As Peter Leinbaugh writes in his landmark study of crime in 18th century London, the social history of hanging must also be an economic history of the trades and working conditions of its victims. Accordingly, a full accounting of the forces that set value in motion requires a global analysis of capital and a social history of its antagonists. Ropes through such a socio-spatial and economic history can illuminate the movement of capital, commodities, and labor as well as the bonds shared by Yucatecan peasants, Chicago labor organizers, dispossessed native people, victims of Jim Crow terror, and others who might be otherwise untraceable within discreetly imagined national, racial, or ethnic histories. <laughs> Unbraiding the strands of, accumul of the accumulation process exposes obscured histories of solidarity and evinces possible futures of shared struggles. Ropes, in other words, help demonstrate how capital, geography, and histories of opposition converge. They illustrate how people have been concretely conjoined across space and how they have consequently understood their fates as interlinked in a global class struggle. 
The rope, therefore, that lynched Mexican rancher Antonio Rodriguez in Rock Springs, Texas on November 3rd, 1910, was tied to broader global regimes of butchery and wider currents of resistance. <laughs> this rope that had bound Rodriguez to a mesquite tree prevented his escape as he was covered with dry branches and doused with gasoline. The rope that trust him as he was burned alive before a gaping mob of thousands. This rope, a tool of the man's trade, became a racist and gendered instrument of imperialist class power. Rodriguez was accused of killing his boss's wife, Effie Henderson. Henderson. The charge came from his boss himself, a man with an established record of violence against the woman. Like Squire Taylor, George Johnson, Charles Davis, and many others before him, Rodriguez was kidnapped from his jail cell by a mob of white vigilantes intent on exacting their own justice. Without trial or due process, Rodriguez was set on fire beneath an endless Texas sky. A flurry of U.S. newspapers vindicated Rodriguez's killers, hailing a common defense of lynching, the protection of white womanhood. Lynchings, of course, were not merely forms of racist terror, but as Ida B. Wells had argued, they were also bloody rituals of aspirational authority. Lynching symbolically affirmed an order wherein white men were by law the dominant owners, heirs, and sellers of property and capital, whether or not they actually possessed property or capital themselves. This order manifested at regional, national, and international levels. The killing of Rodriguez, a Mexican foreign national, constituted a brazen flouting of, in, in, of international law. Less than, 100, less than 100 miles from the U.S.-Mexico border, his murder represented a totality of racist terror, state power, and socio-spatial control codified through notions of gender, class, nationality, and race. The rope that killed Antonio Rodriguez was, in other words, a color line. But the rope that killed Antonio Rodriguez also drew together measures of national and international outrage. Mexican commentators challenged the moral authority of the United States. Progress, civilization, culture, humanitarianism, wrote revolutionary Mexican agitator and journalist Praxedes Guerrero, were ideals that were smothered in the smoke rising, quote, from Rodriguez's charred bones. Guerrero poignantly located Rodriguez's lynching, quote, on the same piece of land that has still not escaped the shadow cast by the hanging of John Brown. Demonstrated rally, uh, demonstrators rallied in defense of Rodriguez across the United States and internationally in countries like Mexico and Cuba. Enraged leaders began calling for a boycott of U.S. goods. Mexican demonstrators rallied at the offices of U.S. newspapers and businesses at the home of the U.S. ambassador and in the streets, often while under fire from Mexican troops. On November 12, 1910, Mexican revolutionary leader Ricardo Flores Magón described this, quote, explosion of, of indignation rocking Mexican cities in response to the lynching. In his internationally circulating newspaper, Regeneración, Flores Magón described how Mexican protesters had condemned Rodriguez's murder, as well as the racist violence committed against Mexicans in the United States. For Flores Magón and other Latin American commentators, this killing was in keeping with the violent encroachment of U.S. imperialism and the avaricious behavior of U.S. millionaires. It was racism that killed Rodriguez, and as Flores Magón noted, quote, it was capitalism that foments racial hatred. On November 20th, 1910, not long after Rodriguez's death and the international protests against it, the Mexican Revolution officially began. During this first major social revolution of the 20th century, the economic geography of the lynch rope would unravel and the politics of the color line would throb at the heart of the global class struggle. This book, Arise, observes how revolutionary thinkers like Flores Magón were uniquely positioned to understand how capital crossed national borders, exploiting workers and peasants, and linking the destinies of those it dispossessed. Following their lead, it foregrounds the influence of the Mexican Revolution, the first major social revolution of the 20th century. So while ropes are not the subject of this book, they serve to illustrate its stakes and scope. They also help illuminate some of the key challenges of this inquiry, to depict the class struggle in motion over time between scales and across space. The book considers how, international, how interpretations of, of internationalism were conditioned by shifts in the political geographies of global capital. It argues that in the late 19th and early 20th century, there was the emergence of a distinct form of geoeconomic imperial power, what W.E.B. Du Bois called the era of the new imperialism. 
Under this model, states not only pursued imperial expansion through overt and formalized territorial annexation, but also through the more insidious dominance of financial control, debt regimes, and threatened militarism. Rather than simply installing a foreign government or practicing direct administration in countries where states sought land, labor, raw materials, or strategic geopolitical locations, investors exerted dramatic financial control over sites of investment and subsequently ensured those investments with the threat or actuality of military intervention. So while territorialism and capitalism cross-fertilized one another throughout the British Empire, in the emergent model of U.S. hegemony, they were, in Giovanni Arrighi's words, quote, indistinguishable. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, U.S. capitalist forces developed the capacities to dictate the terms through which capital was administered, governed, managed, and dispensed on a global scale. In Latin America and the Caribbean, U.S. models of capitalist power were refined with the deepest and most devastating advances initially made in Mexico. So while the Mexican Revolution is often understood as a contained nationalist event, the allied struggle of the Mexican working class and peasantry was largely mobilized against the domination by foreign capital over the national political economy and the dramatic transformation of property ownership and state power. Within these transformations, the U.S. occupied an increasingly decisive role. By the outbreak of the Mexican Revolution in 1910, the American capitalist class owned more than 22 percent of Mexico's surface accounting for nearly a quarter of all U.S. investment and exceeding the total holdings of Mexican entities. Conglomerates like the International Banking Corporation, the, fir the first U.S. multinational bank, emerged in Mexico in 1902, facilitating U.S. investments in Mexican government bonds, mining, oil, agriculture, and other industries. These profits further capitalized U.S. ventures in China, India, Panama, the Philippines, and the Dominican Republic, a capitalist infrastructure later formalized and fortified by U.S. state policy. The U.S.'s relationship to Mexico would therefore play a major part in its emergence during the, new, the era of the new imperialism. Because the Mexican Revolution threatened specific material investments as well as the logic of the period, it challenged the model of the new imperialism and the growing hegemony of the United States therein. Mexico was therefore a prime site within which the shifting logics of capital, labor, and revolution could be thought anew. Indeed, as this book observes, from the vantage point of the Mexican Revolution, the internationalization of capital produced a decidedly internationalist consciousness. The challenge for organizers and theorists has long been to understand the conjoined but distinct forms of oppression under capitalism, and crucially, the ways in which struggle between them have been linked. In other words, the process of uniting people and shared struggle across spaces of difference is certainly not as straightforward as expecting the workers of the world to simply unite. In relating exploited industrial workers to expropriated indigenous people of the Americas, African people dispossessed of their land, enslaved within plantocracies and later subjugated under Jim Crow, colonial subjects concentrated in space and brutally conscripted into extractive economies, and people subjected to military occupation and imperial rule, as well as the convergence between them, require some theoretical elaboration. <laughs> this book offers a framework uh, to broaden the way the revolutionary subjects of history are recognized and also expand the ways capital itself is understood and contested. And it does this through an analysis of the color line. The notion of a color line colloquially refers to an easily identifiable, observable, and knowable line uh, demarcating racial difference. In its most common usage, the term seems to require no explanation, an idiom seemingly interchangeable with racism, itself a phenomenon that assumes shared definitions, even as it is felt and understood with enormous variation. If race was constituted through clearly fixed and shared definitions, it would not require persistent explanation or the constant redefinition of its boundaries. The meaning of race is by design unfixed and shifting. Racial regimes, what political theorist Cedric Robinson describes as constructed social systems wherein race is proposed as a justification for existing power relations are ceaselessly in need of repair. The violence that accompanies them is directly related to their utter instability. In this sense, the lynch rope was, was perhaps the most material form of the color line. The anachronistic terminology of color can be misleading for modern day scholars since the term seems to refer to fixed and observable differences in skin color.
But in one of the earliest usages of the term, the abolitionist Frederick Douglass in, a in an 1881 essay, The Color Line, describes that color itself is, quote, innocent, but clarifies that it was, quote, the things with which it is coupled that make it hated. In his definition, the color line is unstable and uneven, quote, neither uniform in its operation nor consistent in its principles, constantly redrawn in contradictory ways. And while Douglas devotes much of the essay to a discussion of anti-Black racism at the heart of, at the heart of page 14, at the heart of, <laughs> um, U.S. slavery, his definition of the color line is expansive. He links slavery to questions of indigenous land theft and genocide, uh, to violence against Asian immigrants, and to military aggression against Mexicans. He describes the logic employed by Scottish settlers in California in their lynching of Chinese workers. When asked to account for their action, Douglas writes, quote, their answer is that a Chinaman is so industrious, he will do all the work and can live by wages upon which other people would starve. This assignation of purported economic self-interest expressed as homicidal racist hatred represents to Douglas, quote, the inconsistencies of the color line feeling. The color line, of course, is more commonly attributed to W.E.B. Du Bois, who popularized the term in his many writings. His definition of the color line in keeping with Douglas is also repudiated any fixed meanings. It refers instead to a shifting set of logics and spatial practices contingent on the specific local, regional, and national differences and relative to the expansion of capitalist social relations. By analyzing the global situation, he perceives the color line as an ascendant way of thinking that naturalized intensely destructive uh, forces of the global capitalist system. His prediction that the problem of the 20th century would be the problem of the color line became the core of his materialist analysis of emergent American political, economic, military, and cultural power. And in this, he was remarkably prescient. In his early writings, Du Bois observed that the, uh, the operations of the color line in common practices of meaning making, which defined national exteriority, in reviewing the popular foundational myths of the nation, he examined how the practice of, quote, murdering Indians was depicted as advancing U.S. civilization. He noted how American heroes were celebrated relative to their humiliations of Mexicans during the U.S.-Mexico War. He detailed how the enslavement of African people, a transparent contradiction to U.S. democratic principles, was continually resolved by the reassertion of Black inhumanity. More generally, he saw how freedom under the color line was predicated on the idea that, quote, another people should not be free. While enshrined in popular culture and historical myth-making, Du Bois recognized that these characteristics found secure foothold in the policies and philosophies of the state. In his writings, he traced how historically uneven socio-spatial relations were organized according to purported racial differences and how such unequal ways of being were construed as natural. So rather than an observable line, Du Bois observed how the meaning of race was continually drawn and redrawn across space. So while the metaphor of a color line connotes a physical demarcation, a boundary over which something was maintained, Du Bois's color line deftly identified the processes whereby racial regimes attain legibility through space. Taking a historical view, Du Bois charted how the color line found spatial expression in the movement of capital. He recognized that the color line did not operate in the same way in all places and times, but was unevenly and selectively deployed at different scales. In joining world leaders in the struggle against U.S. racism and colonialism, he observed how the color line took shape as a naturalization of violent spatial divisions in the era of the new imperialism. His early writings anticipated how the global strides of finance capital would be marked by the color line's logics and spatial imaginaries. Arise draws from Douglas, Du Bois, and Flores Magallon's writings to describe struggles over the production of space and the territoriality of power in the early 20th century. It argues that antagonisms in and over the production of capitalist space have constituted the basis of the global class struggle. The book seeks to avoid the narrowing tendencies in the historiography of so-called American radicalism, namely to delink and make discrete different struggles as singularly nationally, sectorally, ethnically, or racially bound. Such a, particular, uh, such a particularizing might lend itself to clear exposition, but often at the cost of understanding the astounding ways the class struggles have been understood and collectively fought out by people on the move. 
This book instead seeks to describe how differently situated people were often thrown together in unexpected ways and how in those tumultuous convergences they fought, made new meaning, and took overt and sometimes subtle inspiration from one another, a more dynamic history of struggle that can enliven our sense of early 20th century revolution. Oh, and I'm ahead of slide. Okay, so um, these goals set up multiple quandaries. The first one is already on the screen. How can contestations over capital and the territoriality of power be re represented without reified notions of states, races, or class struggles? How can the class struggle be represented across the capitalist landscape at different scales? How can overlapping processes of exploitation, expropriation, and oppression be understood within spatial struggles? And how can such struggles be analyzed uh, without, simply, uh, without simplifying, flattening, or rendering equivalent different forms of oppression? The primary interventions of this book are therefore theoretical and also methodological. The concept for thinking through various coterminous struggles in this book is convergent spaces. Uh, convergent spaces I define as contradictory uh, socio-spatial sites wherein people from different backgrounds and different radical traditions have been forced together and have subsequently produced new articulations of struggle. The concept enables broad global movements of capital repression, opposition, and ideas to be briefly still and their dynamics observed. Rather than flattening difference across spaces and struggles, this method seeks to examine the intersection of categories in motion. So this book moves through the history of the Mexican Revolution into its afterlife, or as some have argued, its culmination in the 1940s in order to demonstrate the influence of the revolution and the global visions it helped uh, produce. It examines a range of sources from memoirs, oral histories, correspondence, newspapers, radical publications, prison records, private book collections, to lithographic prints culled from national and international archives. In the traditions of social history, anti-racist geography, and feminist political economy that emphasize people's collective struggles and insurgent placemaking, each chapter in this book considers the revolutionary process in the making of a different convergent space. Um, so uh, let me just end this way. That, you know, the history, I think, of internationalism is often most readily accessible as an organizational history. Through such a lens, entities like the first international, the second international, the third international can offer concise illustrations of the ambitious webbing through which global labor, socialist, and communist movements attempted to forge links over spaces and across movements. Similarly, institutional struggles of liberal internationalism covering entities like the League of Nations or the Geneva Conventions can offer discrete and observable histories of how humanitarian ideals became codified through international law. I argue that while conceptions of internationalisms were certainly informed by these entities, something significant is lost to heuristics when this history is presented as reducible to or delimited by these organizations. So this book is concerned with the rich archive that emerges from the excess, the imagination and practice of internationalism by figures often left out of these organizational histories. It argues that their visions, activities, and aspirations offer an important source through which broader histories of internationalism can and should be assessed. These include workers and radicals from the global south, such as Ricardo Flores Magón, whose insights root the political economic arguments in the first chapter, How to Make a Flag, it also considers key figures of radical traditions who, who traverse these institutions but could not be fully situated within them, like W.E.B. Du Bois, whose analysis of the new imperialism and the color line uh, ground both the introduction and much of the second chapter, how to make a map. Subsequent chapters highlight convergences of figures who made extraordinary experiments of internationalism in the spaces in which they found themselves and with the resources uh, available to them. Mm -hmm. Within the walls of Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary is chapter three, how to make a university demonstrates global radicals and working class soldiers of empire found creative ways to teach and learn from one another about the meaning of revolution and the practice of internationalism. Chapter four, how to make love considers how feminists radically reimagine gender, sexuality, and the organization of the family and their conceptions of the state and revolution through the travels of Alexander Kalanta, who was the Soviet diplomat to uh, Mexico in the 1920s. 
Chapter five, how to make a living examines how Mexican farm workers and their families in rural California towns were connected to urban organizing efforts, largely led by women against starvation, unemployment, and eviction in cities like Los Angeles. Chapter six, how to make a dress centers the material realities and dream worlds of black domestic workers in global Harlem and traces how through the artist of Elizabeth Catlett, who does the cover of the book, how their visions align with the revolutionary leg uh, legacy of the Mexican revolution. And as the conclusion, how to make history argues, these expansive conceptualization of internationalism still have much to teach us at present. That's what I got for the presentation. Questions. Too bad. Thank you so much for the talk. <coughs> I haven't read the book yet, but I look forward to reading the book. I'm very curious. I'm very interested. I had a question about some graphic papers. So, a question about uh, you use the term uh, labor regimes and racial regimes. So, I just wanted to know the relationship between the two. Is the labor regime, does it come up first and then? Uh, so the Simon probably the leaders consented to the regime, or uh, so I wanted to know a little bit more about the subjectivity of the labor uh, of people under these regimes. Did they consent to it? If they consented, how did they consent to it? Thanks for the question. Um, I think throughout the term I use is not labor regimes; it's regimes of accumulation. And I do think that there's, uh, you know, I mean, the the book and the theorization of the color line is about its articulation. So I, you know, I, I don't know of a situation where one precedes the other. Uh, and so um, uh, I'm not sure how to answer the second part of the question because I, I you know, I'm, I'm not saying there's a separate labor regime from a racial regime, one that would require consent. I mean, I, I think it's the articulation of all of it at once that we're trying to theorize and understand if, if, if that answers your question. So that was like sort of my level of notes on everything, <laughs> um, including the way you just the form of it all. And I'll start with a little story with the question. You know, I was in Honduras, um, which has its own a la carte production led by United States for a hundred years. And um, I was there, had my first tour of banana plantation about 20 years ago, and I was shown a map of the plantation that happened to be which days they were spraying pesticides. And this longtime union leftist activist. I said, can I take a picture with you, Mike? Because it was November 11th. Which is, and I'm like, can I take a picture of this sign? Because like, it was on November 11th. And I go, he says, great. And I said, yeah. And I tried to explain to him about a market. And he says, ah, I'm well, Martinez de Chicago, the Chicago Martyrs. <laughs> and, you know, and for me, it was just like, you know, like um, and this amazing moment of how stories carry. And, you know, you can, of course, carry United Fruit and why we see there and the unionization of those avocado workers in a general second 54. And so I just thought you would like, you know, you would, you know that, like that. Um, I guess my question, because I've been struggling myself, it's a relationship of this story of accumulation and capitalism and struggle, the relationship between that and women's unwaged labor in the home mm -hmm. and reproductive labor, domestic labor, whatever we want to call it theoretically. And how do we understand, you know, you, there's that hint there of the eviction protest, which I've been writing about, that hint there of the family, but what happens to all that work and how do we understand that under capitalism in relationship to these imperial regimes of extraction of, and, and that keeps, you know, all those workers available, you know, so, it, so I'm just curious how you struggle with that or, you know, dealt with it in the book. Yeah, well, thanks so much for the question, and I hope that you took the picture, and I hope that there's a whole story about a nef of November 11th and the pesticide, you know, <laughs> a fantastic story. Um, so half the book is dealing with this question that you're, you're posing, you know, like, how do we think about, uh, you know, these workers that, you know, don't often arise to the, uh, you know, not that often fall out of our conception of who counts, you know, as workers. Uh, so, you know, chapter 
four, five, and six all concern feminist anti-capitalist struggles, how they're understood, how they're theorized. So uh, the chapter that you mentioned, how to make a living, thinks about this relationship between the unemployed councils of the 1930s, which I know you're writing about, uh, and the uh, struggle of agricultural workers in rural areas of California. So I'm really interested in the organizing that necessarily happened across capitalist space between these two entities, because people realized that workers were being pitted against each other across the capitalist landscape. So, you know, one concrete thing that I talk about in the book is that in the Great Depression, before there was any form of relief, uh, re relief in some instances became contingent on workers in cities going to scab to break strikes uh, in uh, rural areas among agricultural workers. And sometimes we forget when we think about the great labor strikes of the 1930s, you know, we sometimes think of 1934, the general strikes across, you know, docks and factories, the, you know, the a big one, right? But we forget that it was in 1933, the year before, that this entire state was rocked by strikes among farm workers. Uh, and so the organizing against regional capitalist interests, which were themselves tied to, you know, global interests, was a profound struggle. And so I'm really interested in how organizers understood the connection between struggles across uh, this landscape and how they knew uh, to organize uh, both entities simultaneously. And within that chapter, I'm really interested in threading through the story of the Mexican Revolution so I think through the figure of Dorothy Healy, who was a mainstay communist organizer in California, she had been a key organizer in the unemployed councils. You know, she says that the tenant organizing, the women-led organizing of uh, a lot of the unemployed councils was some of the most meaningful organizing she had ever done in her career. And she talks about coming to the Imperial Valley in the 1930s. And she says she's at a strike meeting and she's about to explain to a bunch of workers, you know, here's what exploitation is, here's what a struggle is. And she says in her oral history, she says she starts to realize that she's being met with a kind of patient indulgence. And everybody's kind of crossing their arms and looking at her. And then she says, you know, one of them's like, well, we've been through a revolution. You know, we understand what this is about. When you're ready, you just tell us where to be. So there's a very interesting history of how the history of the revolution is like woven through these struggles. But uh, I mean, you asked how I approach it. You know, the chapter on Alexander Kalanta is, is a way of thinking about how someone who was the commissar of social of welfare in Russia thought about feminist struggles in the revolution in Mexico. It's a, you know, chapter five follows Dorothy Healy and tries to think about how she's concretely linked those struggles. And chapter six thinks uh, with Elizabeth Catlett about black domestic workers in Harlem, their struggle, their, you know, their extraordinary organizing in this period and how she connected them through both her teaching her politics and her art to the struggles of the Mexican revolution. So I don't want to give a concise answer, but you asked how, and I think, you know, I mean, this is, this is, this is the heart of the book. So I thank you for the question. <coughs> Gabriel. Um, my name is Gabriel. I'm a PhD candidate here at CSCA and ESCOM. A um, couple questions kind of came up as you were presenting. Totally fascinated and excited to read the book. The first question was, to what extent do you feel like it's necessary for internationalisms to be self-aware as an internationalism? Because I think there are these moments that you sort of point to where there's a sort of uh, concatenation maybe of, of different struggles that may or may not be conscious of each other, but are, are imbricated, created together. Um, but that is not the same thing as uh, anarchist internationalism or communist internationalism that, that very consciously are identifying as a form of internationalism and one that is actively trying to also transform the world into a stateless uh, form. And, and, uh, and I, it brought me up, of course, brought up thoughts about other iterations of this around uh, the turn of the 21st century with the WTO and, um, and some contemporary struggles, too. And I think part of why I'm wondering about this sort of self-awareness is because it seemed like you were using a spatial analytic to, to argue that the production of space through representation is really critical here. And, and if it's possible to fight on that terrain without a self-awareness as an international sort of subjectivity. And so maybe the invitation is just to say also more about how you're thinking about the production of space as a site of struggle. 
um, because you also then talk about conversion spaces as explicitly social social. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's very relational and it's it's in place from what I would understand mm -hmm. versus and I a kind of representational space that can be pinpointed of all across the world. This is a fantastic question. I, I really appreciate the how you sketched that out. So let me see if I can answer that in two ways. And the first thing I'd say is that I don't think it's either or, it's kind of both and, but I think in the both and, there's some disruption of how we imagine that self-awareness, right? So for example, uh, chapter two thinks about the founding of the Mexican Communist Party, which was, uh, you know, one of the founding members was Emin Roy, who was a fierce, uh, uh, he was a fierce militant in the struggle against British colonialism in India, right? And in the kind of chaos of the period, he, like many others, find themselves in revolutionary Mexico. And, and he has these wonderful stories that he tells in his memoir about how it was in the process of trying to explain, you know, some journalist friends there asked him, he, he ended up in, in Mexico in 1917. They were like, can you write some articles for us to explain the struggle against British colonialism to Mexico, to, you know, Mexican people? And he says, in the course, uh, he said, it was explaining this struggle as, as different from theirs was like carrying coal to Newcastle. This was not something <laughs> unfamiliar, right? Uh, and so, um, you know, there's a very interesting story about how he comes to communism. And some of the story I tell in the book was that actually his famous debate with Lenin on the national and colonial question develops out of his journalism and writings in Mexico. So, you know, in, in this way, that's not a, a, a self-awareness that's produced by the common turn. You know, there's a kind of pre history about how we even get there. Uh, in another chapter, I actually think very specifically about the politics of surveillance, right? And so I think about, it's actually, do, do people in this room know coin the term internationalism? It's not who you think. It was Jeremy Bentham. You knew it, right? All right, ten point. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I think about how Bentham's uh, liberal internationalism and his concept of surveillance view, and I counterpose this with a kind of abolitionist internationalism, and I end with the story of Frederick Douglass, who, you know, after all the kind of speeches and thinking that he's doing, rallying against slavery, also against British colonialism, also against U.S. military aggression in Mexico, uh, he's um, helping to produce a kind of abolitionist internationalism that uh, produces this extraordinary solidarity that's incipient in the, in the production of the first international. So, you know, I'm, I'm trying to contrast this idea of sight and self-awareness. There's a kind of surveillance that Bentham and this form of liberal internationalism is producing. And then there's a kind of internationalism from below that works precisely because people identify a connection with each other, even if they can't see each other. Mm -hmm. So I think this is really important because you know, this is a book, I would say, of the 21st century, late 19th, early 20th century. I mean, the, the idea of convergent spaces comes about because anybody who's been involved in any kind of struggle knows that, you know, people bring different experiences to the table. As Peter Kwan says in the book Chinatown, you know, too often we think about U.S. radicalism, it's as if people's history begin as soon as they come to this country. And we have no record of the histories and theories and political experiences that, you know, shape them before before they came and that they necessarily bring into struggle, right? So, you know, in, in a certain way, the convergence space is a way to give name that's not simply the kind of um, uh, traditional containers of radicalism that I think can often trap and hamper our imagination of internationalism, but it's also a way of giving a name to something that I feel like is done every single day in every kind of struggle. So that's how I would answer that. Great. Thank you. Yes. Oh, so. <laughs> 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 yeah, Max actually whispered in my ear and said, oh, okay. next, so I just want to respect, <laughs> oh, respect and affirm. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't care either way. But, uh, in, in any case, yeah, uh, very good to see you here, Christina. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you so much for sharing your work with us today. It's, it's very inspiring. Um, my name is Will, by the way, from History of Consciousness. Um, I want to sort of hone in on the very last line uh, of what you shared with us, which was sort of uh, evoking what you're going to do in the conclusion of the book and not having read, read the book yet. Um, I'm, I'm interested particularly how 
your understanding the lessons of, of this book for, for the here and now. Um, I think uh, one of the major themes of what you shared with us has to do with how like the internationalization of capital creates the conditions for an internationalist consciousness uh, and also um, how sort of like the generalization of the commodity form, if I'm, if I'm understanding right, and like, you know, how you're organizing each chapter, um, each, you know, there's a, like a, a world within like this commodity form that has all these different struggles linked to it. Um, and so it's, it really makes me think about uh, the solidarity across time and space, you know, it's like how, how are we not only in solidarity with people, um, you know, like, you know, in Palestine or, or in Peru or, you know, or something like that, but how, how are we in solidarity with like, you know, um, Flores Magón mm -hmm. and how we carry out our struggles <laughs> and like enacting the ideals of those struggles in the here and now. So um, I guess there's kind of like a, a method question that I have and maybe like a practical question, like, um, and the method question is, um, in doing the kind of historiographical work you're doing, um, how do you, you know, how do you see the applicability of what was happening with the changing, you know, accumulation strategies of capital in the, the era of the Mexican Revolution to like our own, you know, era of a murderous, you know, imperialist regime of, of capital accumulation, expanding capitalism. Like, are the two eras? How are, how are we in similar and distinct eras, I guess, sure. is that question. Yeah. Um, and then also, I think linked to that is, uh, you, know, it seem, you know, it seems like there was much more kind of, there was like a way that people imagined what they're doing that was very like fluid. And uh, like they readily imagined how to link up their struggles in, in a way I think that Gabriel was, was also, uh, Evoking and how how are we doing with that now? I guess <laughs> and uh, like you know, what's uh, what would you say are the constraints and how we imagine our struggles as linked now that you that you would sort of point to or critique from the standpoint of this book? Sure, thanks for the question. I really appreciate that. Um, let's see, hold on. Let's see, it would be like it doesn't matter. So I appreciate it very much. Um, I think the point of this book is to say that internationalism is always forged and never found, right? And so I think part of my interest in calling attention to the active process of making is also an invitation, you know, to show that this is an ongoing active process that has continually to be made and remade. So, you know, the title of the book is the first word of the international, and I really see it in the spirit of other texts that have taken lyrics of the song to try to think about the struggle of internationalism in different moments, right? Most famously, Wretched of the Earth, right? She Wretched of the Earth. Also, Dorothy Healy, before she left the, just after she left the Communist Party, she uh, did an oral history with Maurice Isherman, where she said, you know, if I were to write a memoir, I would want it to be called Traditions Chains Have Bound Us, right? A slight adaptation of the internationalist lyrics. <laughs> then she says, as soon as the radical tradition stops critiquing, stops questioning, you know, like relies kind of flatly on different understandings from different periods, it's no longer radical. It's become something else instead, right? So I think this is the spirit that animates this book. And it's a question, not an answer, right? You know, how do we get, how do we think about this history as an open invitation? And how do we do the work of making now? So I suppose that some of the intervention in doing that is a way of saying that these are incredibly uncertain times, right? And I think in times of uncertainty, there is a tendency to reach for, to lean upon things that we find to be certain. And sometimes these can be radical traditions, radical formulations, right? Uh, and so in the conclusion, I talk about how, you know, when politics becomes something to which loyalty is pledged, rather than something that's constantly interrogated and made, you know, there's a place of a kind of artificial certainty, an artificial feeling of strength, rather than the kind of vulnerability of not knowing. So, I mean, I take as an inspiration the different figures in the book who um, I, I think connected to your question, you know, certainly did move through the world in very fluid ways. The early 20th century, you know, radical formations were not as hardened or concretized as we sometimes imagine them to be anachronistically, you know, like anarchist, socialist. I mean, you know, the reason I think about the international was, you know, there's a number of stories in the book about, you know, people who were 
uh, you know, from a number of different traditions who are singing the song together, who move through those different spaces, quite fluid formation. I think that's exceptionally important now because once we start thinking about radical traditions as typology that we slot ourselves into rather than something that's open that we can each make, we lose something profound in terms of how we can interrogate the current struggle before us. Please, Max Shaw. Yeah, thanks. That was really inspiring. And I'm, I'm just curious, given the, the sort of the, the multiple streams that feed into internationalism, radical internationalism in the turn of the century, late 19th, early 20th century, and it's a sort of related to Gabriel's question. What were, the, what were some of the specificities of the Mexican Revolution in its international existence and in its international presence? Because, of course, and we kind of know the Bolshevik case, also, you know, some of those post Austro Hungarian Empire struggles for new states and things like that. So, I wonder just from a sort of eventual perspective, how, you know, what, what, what particularities kind of endured in the Mexican Revolution? Sure. Thanks for the question. I think, you know, every chapter explores that question in a different way. So, I'll just kind of answer by talking through one of them. So, you know, one of these chapters came about by the mere fact that I was fascinated by the fact that one of the key agitators, organizers, journalists of the Mexican Revolution, Ricardo Flores Malone, died in Kansas. Not only did he die in Kansas, but quite a lot of his organizing during the revolution happened in the United States. It happened in El Paso. It happened in St. Louis. It happened disproportionately in Los Angeles, right? So in going to try to... Um, figure out that story. I went to the National Archives in the Central Plains region in Kansas City, Missouri, and looked through his files, and also looked through the files of the other people who were incarcerated there at the time. Uh, in World War I, there was the enactment of the Espionage and Sedition uh, Acts, which uh, basically criminalized dissent as a federal crime. So you have in this prison, you know, I mean, radicals of all stripes. There were, you know, pacifists, anarchists, communists from around the world, you know, uh, and there was this continual problem of radicals being incarcerated at Leavenworth and leaving as organizers. So, you know, young J. Edgar Hoover personally monitored the black wobbly uh, industrial worker, the world member Ben Fletcher's mail, because he was such a talented organizer there. And there's a very interesting presence of how the Mexican Revolution weaves through the different forms of agitating and organizing that happens within the prison. So the prisoners actually make good on this, uh, you know, the, the uh, Department of Justice calls Leavenworth the University of Radicalism. It turns out they actually had a university. Ricardo Flores Magón was one of many uh, incarcerated radicals who lectured to the prisoners. Um, his brother, Enrique Flores Magón, wrote a regular column in the newspaper that the prisoners wrote and produced themselves called Mexican Kaleidoscope. And, you, and so, you know, in these serialized stories, you know, in every issue, he's telling the other prisoners the story of the Mexican Revolution. And then when you look at the kind of appeals that the wobblies, that socialists, you know, articles that people are writing for the liberator from prisoners, campaigns that they're issuing, there's this really fascinating way where some of the ideas, the metaphors, the, their understanding of the Mexican Revolution is tied in to their own campaigns. So, you know, this is just kind of like, uh, there's a there's a kind of meta argument about how we think about the Mexican Revolution in the era of the new imperialism that I worked through in the uh, intro and first chapter, and then there are these kind of smaller, I think, unanticipated ways in which the revolution itself, uh, you know, offers this very unique and I think underappreciated setting within which different radical traditions converge. Max and then Sean. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you. For your <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, th I think uh, the the category of uh, of uh, internationalization, especially internationalization of capital, I think has to be uh, is a theoretical question. I think has to be defined as a internally differentiated. So I think uh, internationalism is. Uh, internationalism of capital is a kind of a, a combination of a capital and the state. So you have on the one hand the, the global tendencies of capital, 
uh, the deterritorialization, if you want, of capital. On the other hand, you have the state. So the, for capital to work, capital needs some stability definitions. It needs uh, uh, physical demarcations and other kind of demarcations. So it's the, always a combination, a kind of a, 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 a unstable combination of these two dimensions. And uh, so in the question is, uh, let's call it uh, this, uh, com this, uh, this entanglement of the capitalism and the state, let's call it for a moment convergence from above. Mm -hmm. Yes. So now the question is, uh, what the convergence from below should look like if uh, we want to have an alternative? Because, uh, because the question is, uh, if you want, if uh, we have a, 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 a definition of internationalism, I'm not saying this is uh, your definition, but if we define internationalism on the basis of, uh, let's say, anti-imperialism, that is uh, not enough. Why? Because it doesn't consider this uh, dimension of, uh, of uh, particularities and localities. It's uh, just uh, an identity that is defined against something else. And, and there were many attempts to do this, you know, from Baku, uh, 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 in, uh, so the, the Bolsheviks basically failed because they couldn't uh, define their uh, agreement on the basis that is more solid than a generic anti-imperialism, the holy war against something. So, so the question is basically, how, how would you combine these two dimensions, the, the locals, you know, when workers move from one place to another, they, when they are in the same place, they, they have uh, habits, they have some traditions, customs. Uh, sometimes they fight to defend foremost lives, not just against something else. So, so question is, did you consider this uh, uh, entanglement of these uh, two dimensions, the local and the in the international or the local, I would say, and the translocal, and I, how do they work in empirical specific cases? Mm -hmm. well, I should say, you know, my theorization of uh, this particular period of um, how I understand the shifting shape of capital is informed by, I think, a dialogue between W. E. Du Bois and Giovanni Ricci. I think that there's quite an interesting discussion between the two that I, um, I if, if somebody knows that this is done, I hope they'll tell me because I don't want to claim to be the first. So, you know, a reading helps us understand this period as the kind of waning of British hegemony and the rise of US hegemony. Du Bois in several pieces, including the African Roots of War in 1915 and an article on Mexico, just called Mexico in 1914, And some of the things that I think are quite interesting about how he's describing the shifting, uh, the, the, the shifts in this period is they are as, uh, I, I think they're in alignment with how Arie is thinking about the deterritorialization of capital in the period. But what Du Bois says is this very interesting feature of the subjectivity of the new imperialism, right? So he says, how, how, how do people think about themselves within this process, right? So uh, in his narration, the, the new imperialism distinguishes itself from an era of an older imperialism because it, it appears that finance, uh, that finance democratizes, right? That there is apparently uh, the ability of uh, it, the average working class person to claim to be a small shareholder of empire. Right. So, you know, in Arrighi's formulation, what makes this a hegemonic project is that the interest of financiers, right, the newly empowered interests of financiers in the late 19th century are identified by a white working class as their own. The general interest is identified as uh, the specific interest is identified as the general interest. And so what this is important for Du Bois is he says it, in that leap uh, in that we, there is a social project for people to imagine that a vision of the world as like endlessly available for the spoils, Mexico in particular, right? As a place in which US financiers can go, they can make their fortune. You know, these are B. Travin's, uh, you know, novels all about the fortune hunters, you know, from the US. 
that the visions of finance capital are allegedly available to uh, you know, the average person as long as they adopt the logics of the color line, right? So the book, as much as I've probably presented it as a book of successful conversions, is half the book is about that struggle. How do people avoid the seductions of the subjectivities of the new imperialism? How do they refuse the seductions of the color line? Because there are quite a lot of people, you know, who underwent the same experiences, were in the compression of the same conversion spaces, who took quite reactionary approaches, who went to Mexico, who saw all the same things and decided they could be small shareholders, they could be small property owners. They that this logic, this new subjectivity was available for them to individually come up. So I think what's critical in the struggle for internationalism is precisely that, right? How do you defeat those seductions? And I think that that's an, an essential point because it continues to be the problem now, right? You know, I mean, what is the major federal mm -hmm. internationalism? It's not just racism per se. It's a racist vision of understanding the world who is deserving of help, who is deserving of self-determination, who is deserving, uh, you know, it, it, like for me, that is an initial block to how solidarity is even formed. And I just think that that conversation doesn't need to begin in recent history, that, you know, as long as 100 years ago, Du Bois has some very helpful ways of understanding this period of U.S. hegemony coming into being. Yeah, so actually building off of that, um, well, I have two questions. The first one uh, has to do with that. So if what you're saying is that Du Bois sees um, like cap capitalism in the U.S. in particular, I suppose, having a need to produce a racial other, um, then I was struck by your comment about the lynching and how it relates to aspirations for dominance. And I guess what I wonder is if this then implies that like members of the white working class sort of see themselves as perspective like, you know, financiers or capitalists of whatever sort, but there's some other function that's being played there. So that's my first question. Uh, my second is a little more far afield and I don't know if this is the <coughs> <laughs> well, I'm curious because, you know, it's clear that um, this relationship between science and the color line, color line being mediated through, like, capitalist ideology um, serves as kind of, like, warning against, you know, a sort of, like, naive, like, scientific realism or something. Um, but, you know, I haven't read your book, so I was curious because you said that there's, like, a chapter on gender, I think. And this seems to be, like, really part of what's at stake today, for instance, when we talk about, like, trans rights and so on and so forth. And so I was, I was just curious about, um, you know, whether I'm, like, extrapolating too far, if you could say something about, you know, uh, science, science's, like, relationship to, like, capital ideology and how that plays out. Two totally similar questions. <laughs> yeah, right. right. All right, well, let me take the first one first. And I just want to make sure that I'm not understood. So when I'm talking about, you know, the kind of conscription of the white working class into these projects and subject to be the new imperialism, I'm certainly not saying all white people, right? Or that, you know, this was simply that kind of identity. So in chapter two, here's another pop quiz. Everybody's familiar with the Langston Hughes poem, A New World Dreams of Rivers, right? I've known rivers. Does anybody know where Du Bois was when he wrote that poem? He was going to Mexico to see his father, right? And so there's a very interesting story about how Du Bois, in um, his memoir, one of his memoirs, The Big C, thinks about how his father absorbed this subjectivity of the new imperialism, right? His father, you know, his growing up, Du Bois would go back and forth between uh, his mother in Chicago, uh, who was a white working, a, a black working class waitress in Chicago, and his father, who was this small hacienda owner, who, you know, like, uh, went to Mexico with all the dreams I talked about, you know, like, big property dreams, it, you know, Mexico, revolutionary Mexico for him wasn't a place where he could find solidarity with you know, people struggling there. It was a way in which the, the color bar did not prevent him from being a small property owner. And Du Bois has these extraordinary comments where he says it was in triangulating his experience, watching how his father, a black man from the United States, treated indigenous 
people in Mexico that his his sense of his own mother's position in Chicago came into a new view, right? So just in response to the first question about how we think about the racial other, I just I just want to I don't want to be misunderstood as saying that there's anything hardened about how this racial ideology comes about. You know, I mean I, I think that's the great seduction of the subjectivity of the new imperialism. It is available to anybody. You know, I mean it's it's, it's like at this moment, right? Uh, you know, I mean, I, I think we're still maybe failing to grapple with the fact that there is so much support for for, for far right white supremacist, you know, um, uh, nationalist ideology from people of color. Who, you know, we just assume that the appeals to anti racism would solve that, but it, you know, it, there, there's quite a lot, as you know, from your work of consent to it. So it's something to deal with. The science question, I'm going to have to think about how exactly you're making the connection between science, capital accumulation, gender, and the, you know, uh, moral panics over transgender people, over like queer theory as grooming now. I think there's an answer there. I don't know how it all goes in my head together around science, but I will say that the, the chapter on Alexander Kalantai, you know, is an investigation of a Bolshevik feminist, somebody who, uh, you know, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a chapter about failure. Right? It's a chapter about how someone who was actively involved in the, in the attempted construction of a new Soviet state tried to employ these ideas of um, the feminist theories, right? How could you rebuild society? Uh, and how could you put a total transformation of gender, of sexual relations, of normative, heteronormative uh, social organization of families? Could you organize society without that? So, you know, some people have said it's kind of a gloomy chapter because it's not, you know, there's nothing that's built there. It's a way of contrasting what she imagined in Sorry. Uh, so that's that's my by way of an answer. I think sound is gone. Do you mind putting it back on yours? And then I'm going to take it off here. Like again. Like again. It's working now. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, on and so the audio is not on, but the mic's on. Okay. Yeah. We can hear again now. He's okay now. Yeah. They say he's okay. Thank you, Ruben. Bye. I think it's, it's really a fascinating presentation. Um, I have two questions, one more empirical um, and the other one more theoretical. I'll start with the empirical. Um, I, I mean, I love the story about the production of the world. It was absolutely fascinating. And what I did wonder um, is whether the different groups of workers that you so skillfully outlined and brought together were aware that they were producing a commodity that was essentially, or at least one of the uses of which was going to be hanging revolutionaries, dissidents, and um, you know, contributing to the creation of the cultural mind. And if so, if they did have an awareness of this, how did that ricochet back into their understanding of what they were doing in order to sustain their own livelihood? Um, and this is the question, it's more theoretical, and this is partly because of my ignorance of the content of the book, and I'm really looking forward to reading it. I wasn't, I, I would love to hear a little bit more uh, about, you know, what you are privileging sort of as the engine of these linkages. Because initially with the, with the rope example, I thought that it was more of an object-driven analysis that connects different spaces and people in different ways, in unexpected ways, mm -hmm. an object or a commodity. But then you seem to switch to, you know, journalists, femi you know, feminist figures, labor leaders, et cetera. So much more of an agency driven, mm -hmm. especially the agency of those who are maybe more mobile than a lot of uh, their counterparts at the time who are actually doing the, the uh, labor, um, unless they're immigrant labor. 
Um, and then, and then towards the end, I had the sense that, especially with the convergent spaces argument, that you were privileging maybe a more space-driven account of how this internationalism is being forged, sort of casting together people from different backgrounds with different experiences. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't know. I mean, maybe it's all of the above, but I also had the sense that maybe I'm not getting like what you are privileging as the main engine of this nascent uh, internationalism. So can you talk a little bit more about your theoretical presuppositions and what sort of brings all of these three different um, dimensions together? That would be mm -hmm. So to answer your first question, I'll say that I think there was very clear understanding uh, by the producers of the raw material of rope and the kind of tyranny of the final commodity, because as I said, you know, like the, um, the Hennekin itself became a whip uh, and uh, indigenous workers and the Yucatan handle regularly whipped with the Hennekin, you know, so there was no mystery about the processing of this fiber and it becoming an instrument of tyranny. Um, so, uh, I, yeah, I mean, by way of an answer, I would say, you know, yes and no, not always. I mean, I think it depends um, at what point of the procurement, but there definitely are moments where, uh, or incidents where people have that kind of clear understanding. This is, I'm producing this thing, I will be beat by this thing. I'm producing this thing, my hands will be bound by this, I'll be hung by this thing. You know, I don't think this was in a mystery, you know, in Jim Crow share cotton regimes, you know, when people were harvesting hemp or, or cotton to produce, you know, materials that would terrorize them, right? So um, the book does open in what appears to be a commodity change story, you know, and I think that's intentional because I think increasingly these are the ways that we, uh, these are maybe more familiar ways into global global, you know, um, global story, stories of global capital, but it does take a different turn. And that's also intentional. It's a way of saying, you know, like, this is not just a question of what's congealed and embedded in the commodity, but how do we think differently about the process that are conjoined and the awareness, lack of awareness, the potential, you know, of solidarity between the different people who are conjoined by it. So in terms of what I'm privileging, I would like to say that, you know, there, there's both um, stories I follow that are uh, quite bright with a kind of awareness of how this produces, how this, you know, um, consolidates into an understanding of internationalism. And sometimes this is just about the potential for it to happen. But I think the awareness is, is interesting. And I'll just say a little bit about how I come to the story. My family is from Okinawa. They, like a lot of people, came to California through Mexico. Um, and the way I came to this story was hearing from a relative that, uh, you know, his father had been a labor organizer in the Imperial Valley. He would speak Spanish, English, Japanese, and Okinawan dialects, and he was very well, well placed. Before, uh, in the early rounds, of, before the internment, there were these early FBI raids, and, you know, my relative was someone who was targeted because he was such a well-placed organizer. And his son told me that as he confronted these FBI agents, that he knew how to take care of business because he had been down with Pancho Villa, and like he knew how to, you know, he knew how to handle himself. So there was this like apocryphal story about not only did my family come to Mexico, but that they had this engagement with the Mexican Revolution. I was really interested in because initially I just thought this reframes the way we think about Asian American radicalism. You know, like what if this is not for Japanese Americans something that we kind of you know, trace through resistance to immigration law, resistance to the internment, but something that begins with solidarity in Mexico. I thought that was really interesting. So I looked through my relatives' records, and it was Masai, uh, Masawi Mashiro. What I found was the records of a man named Paul Kochi. Uh, he lived in the Imperial Valley with my family. He traveled very similar path. There have been some people, uh, you know, since I published this, who've come out of the woodwork to say, you know, all Okinawans are related, you're probably distantly related, I haven't not claiming that yet. Paul Koshi wrote a memoir called Iman no Iowa, An Immigrant Sorrowful Tale, where he talks about this journey through revolutionary Mexico, and it's through his own words that he describes how in this journey he discovered internationalism. And it's a totally fascinating story about how he makes sense of all the commonalities of struggle that he's encountering. He's in a deportation center, he's in a jail cell, you know, he's a uh, 
you know, the ship refuels in Hawaii, he sees the Kanaka Maoli workers unloading luggage, right? And the passengers on the upper decks throwing change just to watch these, you know, men dive into the waves. And he just, you know, in some places it's rage. In other places, people kind of spirit him away over the top. And he's describing the whole time how it's uniquely in revolutionary Mexico that he comes to find this position of internationalism that I think is really fascinating. So it so I guess the answer to your question is yes, all. You know, it's a, it's it is a spatial question. I'm quite interested in how the contradictory spaces produced through global capital in this period threw together these kind of unanticipated assemblages of people, and that there was a theoretical point that happened in their struggle. One that wasn't determined in advance, one that wasn't always, you know, didn't burst out into revolution. We'd be living in a different world if it was, but something that I think shifts the way we uh, track the history of internationalism that I think offers some really important openings to the present. Other questions? Any question from the people on Zoom? I don't really have a question, maybe just a comment, because I was struck by your answer to Sean's question uh, about science at that specific period. Mm -hmm. um, that was uh, many historians of science would call the eclipse of Darwinism, right? So Darwin was misconceived, misconstrued, and then that led to genetic eugenics, social Darwinism at that time, which you are the main. Uh, a racial ideology of the new imperialism. So I think your use of the color line is brilliant to sort of stay away from that language. And in general, I think you you creatively deploy a lot of language that uh, 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 rid of a lot of baggage for black. And then uh, we can describe this kind of international more clearly. Let's say. Well, thank you for that. And that's my answer to your question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Maya. Hello. Um, oh, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 Can you hear me? Oh, thank you so much. Okay. I am very, um, I, I just kind of want to, I'm, I'm connecting from Mexico. It is an honor to, to be able to be in this space with you all. Um, I've been following your work, uh, Cristina, for a while. And I just wanted to maybe ask a comment on uh, sort of like you were speaking just now, answering a question about um both uh, the the material uh, cohesion that could be of of becoming of understanding this global radicality as something uh, from the past. So I, I was thinking more in terms of um, traducibility. I don't know if you're familiar with that concept, but it is about um, uh, translating the intention as something that has been said in the past or has been done in the past. In this case. Um, you know, producing revolution or producing uh, rebellions. Uh, I'm thinking about it in terms of indigenous movements throughout the Americas. How can we think about the traditability of the resistance nowadays coming from the understanding of indigenous people and indigeneities also in terms of how we need to look at the past in order to understand the future? Uh, this means uh, liberating um, through, you know, sorting or um, discovering new um, nuances uh, that were pending in time and that in some ways may mean re-signifying the past so that we could actually talk about in uh, nowadays, you know, uh, like a renewed relevance of some type of, of uh, revolution. So I don't know if that makes sense, uh, but it means to me like your word, that's, that's what it's transmitting to me. So I just wanted you to, if you could please comment on that. Well, first, 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 first
technology. Mayra, thank you so much for uh, zooming in and thank you for your question. I, I just have, um, I'm, I'm not sure I heard the term, if it was transmutability, it would, if you could put it in the chat, because I'm afraid to, <laughs> uh, let me just see if I, traducibility. I haven't heard of this term. Thank you very much, traducibility. That's uh, fantastic. Um, uh, I have... I've learned so much from uh, Indigenous struggles at present. They're a part of the history I trace. I know Will because we were both speakers at a Native Liberation Conference. Where actually, I think um, I, some of the best feedback I got for the book was from the young organizers there who were like, well, yeah, we want to rethink 1848. You know, uh, what does this look like from uh, the perspective of, uh, you know, the, the kind of struggles that we were talking about? So um, maybe I'll say this, though, you know, Afadi Bartowell has a really fascinating article called Moving Beyond Models, where, you know, in, in here and in others uh, of uh, articles he's written, he really thinks a lot about what it means to have an exemplar of revolutionary history, you know, particularly European, bourgeois revolutions, uh, the uh, French Revolution, uh, struggles of 1848, and how, you know, whether consciously or subconsciously, if we don't displace these exemplars, every other revolutionary attempt, activity becomes, he says, belated or deficient, right? It's a kind of an impossibility. So part of what I do in the book is to think actually about um, the uh, coterminous struggles. I mean, there's a kind of whole, chapter one is... Um, uh, a, a rethinking of internationalism from the Haitian Revolution, right? So I'm trying to think about an abolitionist internationalism, but I'm really trying to think about how um, how struggles by indigenous people against colonialism are intertwined with abolitionist struggles in a way that I think we don't always uh, allow for. So, you know, the mere fact that uh, Haiti gave material aid, gave shelter, gave ships, uh, you know, gave um, advice to uh, uh, revolutionary movements in the Americas that were resisting Spanish colonialism on the condition, on the condition that any liberated state could not uh, could not reproduce slavery, would have to abolish slavery, meant that abolition was at the heart of anti-colonial struggles in ways that I think changes some of the 19th century uh, history of um, uh, internationalism that we inherit. So, you know, I mean, it's a kind of short answer to a very long question. I thank you for the question. I thank you for this term, traducibility, which I'll have to think more of, but I appreciate uh, appreciate you zooming in. And I, 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 I hope to be in dialogue with you, Myra. Thank you so much. We have time for another question. Thank you. Yes. This is just a technical question, but maybe you've answered it for the language issues. I mean, just writing, having gone on the path of writing about international isms and having that trying to get away from a North South perspective on them is like really challenging, you know. And certainly in the writing of US history, I mean, how grad units about thinking transnationally and the number of languages we need to have and the level we have to have them. And here, and to get away from our very recent perspectives of, and I'm curious what languages you can read and um, how you struggle with that and how it shaped you. Yeah, um, uh, I, I like to say that hopefully this is the first installment of many other projects, not all of which I will write. In fact, probably most of them I won't, um, because I do think that there's, you know, I mean, since I've put the book out, I've been in dialogue with a number of scholars from around the world who say, well, this is very helpful for thinking through this struggle. And it's, you know, in a context I'm totally unfamiliar with. So, I mean, this book required, a, you know, I mean, for example, in chapter four, I draw very heavily on Alexandra Kolontai's diplomatic diary, which thankfully feminist scholars in Mexico have translated into Spanish from Russian, right? But that's, you know, it's it's a translation of a translation. There've also been some UA space scholars who have 
like work with different sections in English. So, you know, there was like kind of continual checking, but I don't speak Russian. Uh, you know, I actually have drawn very much on scholars like Ani Mukherjee, who do speak Russian, who've been to the Comintern archives. Um, so, I mean, a lot of the production of the book was solidarity itself, right? I mean, I don't speak Okinawan dialects. I, you know, had to rely on a lot of other people's translations. So, you know, there's more to do. <laughs> I think your question is totally right on. And this is completely in keeping with Deborah Weber's um, you know, uh, injunction that if you're going to talk about international and transnational histories, and you know, we, we have to think about the hegemony of English and what that does to the sources that we draw from or don't draw from. So I totally take the point. And, um, you know, I mean, my hope is that there'll be many other studies with a lot of other people from different contexts. I have, a, I have a related question, maybe it's about the translation of internationalism. Um, so I think a translation is a, is a good term in this conversation. And so what makes a translation possible is uh, the existence of a something that is a common to the different languages. Mm -hmm. And uh, at least this is the the Benjaminian approach, you need something in common, and then the translation modifies both the recipients and, 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 and the other language, and the original language. So the, the point is that uh, uh, when we are talking about, uh, when we talk about the internationalism, do we have it is uh, something in common between languages, which are different from each other. And what is this something in common that we have when we talked about internationalism? Because uh, I think uh, we, we should, uh, maybe we agree or we disagree that uh, internationalism cannot be based on the only common thing that is a, a common enemy. I think that yes, was the, yes, that yes. was the in a certain way that was also the, the the tragedy and the collapse of the 20th century. So the only thing we have in common is that we have a common enemy, mm -hmm. and then obviously at a certain point things fall apart because uh, it's not sufficient to have a common enemy. So how how translation can help us and your project to find these like different kinds of a group mm -hmm. that can hold together differences without neutralizing the differences, but at the same time by producing something else mm -hmm. that is common. I wish you could, could I just pack on that? Yeah. Sorry. Um, well, because I have some okay. question, and it was about because there was like a point when you were talking about not wanting to like flatten out you know differences between different struggles, but I guess I'm curious. How something like a like a like a uh, like a meta concept might um, like relate these things and like whether there's like what's the how appropriate that is for? I I wish Gabriel were still in the room. I'd shock you all by knowing something about local Santa Cruz, you know, avant garde artistic space. If I understand it, uh, Gabriel's involved in the artistic space called New Mexico. Yeah, yeah. I, we met on the games the other day. So uh and and so um he and his friend were explaining to me that in Dexapol is uh, and this is new to me so I don't know uh but they, they were saying if anybody knows tell me uh in Dexapol is a way of gesturing to exactly this concept right how do we have a common language with out the presumption of a common reference. So, you know, I think an indexical is something like um, it's contingent on a certain type of shared meaning. So if I say I'm here, you know, it, it's contingent on this location. So I think this is really brilliant, this question of translation. Um, I know you picked this up in a lot of your work too in very helpful ways. Uh, how do we have a shared language of internationalism, a shared vision without a common reference? And particularly, I think this is absolutely right, a weakness is when a common reference is simply a uh, defensiveness. We are commonly conjoined against something, you know, like uh, instead of a negation of negation, right? You know, like what's, what's the vision we're moving towards? Um, 
So, so what can I say? I feel like I exhausted all my brain cells trying to remember what it is. Actually, what it is. I mean, I would just say that, you know, I appreciate the comment earlier about like how what the work does is try to kind of take up and renovate some old left categories, right? Because I think part of the problem with reference is they're so charged. They have so much, as you said, baggage, right? That they can be, they don't, it, it, there's not a, dexterous way we can move through them always. You know, there's quite a lot of ground clearing, you know, by anti-capitalist, I mean, by left, I mean, by internationalism, I mean, right? And then you, I mean, I mean, I mean, people out of the room, right? <laughs> like, like, well, how do we think about this project together? So, uh, you know, I mean, I, 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 I fear I'm just going to be repeating myself uh, from before, Max, but I feel like it's, this is, it, this is not a small proposition to open these radical, traditions up to something that is alive at this moment, because I feel like part of the kind of uncertainty and insecurity of this moment, the kind of like retreat into past histories and past formulations and past common references, like is, is so detrimental to how we can envision a common project now, right? We know so much what we're against, right? We, we and sometimes the certainty is being a kind of like radical bean counter and being able to say, well, this is not radical in this way, or this is not radical in that way, as if that's a powerful thing to do. Meanwhile, you know, our opponents are quite assertive in their common projects, right? So, I mean, in a certain way, we have to develop a, divi a, a, a vision of things that's as powerful as the forces that are being arrayed against us, which have a very consistent and common vision, and it's not afraid of thinking about power. So, you know, I don't, I don't have an easy answer. I don't think anybody can, but I think that I suppose part of my ground clearing is just the way of saying that the things that make us feel powerful, the things that make us feel certain are actually uh, precisely the things that remember our ability to develop a reference suitable for developing solidarity at present. Could, could you uh, no other questions, I think. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.